the name of the game for the last 10, 20 years, 30 years is you handcraft features. A lot of us uh, were familiar with Fourier transforms. So you have a complicated time domain signal, you take a Fourier transform, and out pops two frequencies. And you say, oh, that's easy. I can get rid of the noise with a high pass filter or low pass filter. You transformed to a domain where the signal looked a very simple way. So handcrafted feature engineering is that process of finding that Fourier transform or that whatever it is that transforms you into a space where your data makes sense. And, and then you kind of just separate it with lines between it. That's the learning process. The learning. Um, some machine learning enthusiasts will, will not like me for this, but it's relatively simple. What, and that's, that's absolutely not fair, and machine learning stands on a pedestal of 50 years of, of magnificent Bayesian probability theory, and the, the frameworks between deep learning and machine learning are more similar than they are different. But the one thing that machine learning doesn't do well is you spend, uh, you, you need to, apply a lot of domain expertise to make these handcrafted features. Well, one of the big things with deep learning is that it uses incredibly uh, complicated models with many more parameters to find the features themselves. So this is a network trained on faces. And whenever you train a convolutional neural image network, that's what this is, on any objects, the first layer in this network, this cartoon is these are weights and biases, and some of you may have seen this, um, I, if I get into explaining it, it'll, it'll go too much into the weeds, but you're basically training the network, you're training the numerical weights of these sets of connections, and the first layer of images are these filters to the right of the person, the woman's face. Those are called Gabor filters. They're line and edge filters, and it makes the observation that you can construct hierarchically any feature that you can draw with these simple basis functions. So for faces, you take these lines and edges, you construct parts of a face and then an entire face. And these are hierarchical feature sets. A lot of problems in the world are hierarchical. Language, right? Characters, words, sentences, paragraphs, novels, Shakespeare. Um, the human body, medicine, atoms, proteins, molecules, uh, you know, subcellular structure, cellular structure, organs, functioning organism. Um, you know, again and again, plenty of problems like that. And so um, what deep learning can do is it can automatically, given enough data, find these ways to factorize and find features that you would not have discovered because there are just too many combinations by yourself. And so the traditional machine learning approach would take an image of a cat and basically say, well, let me, let me construct an ear detector. And a cat has triangular ears and a round head and a chubby body. So let me make a chubby body detector. Well, a deep neural network would just take this first layer and say, well, here's my ear detector. It's two 45 degree lines and a flat line. And that looks like a cat's ear if I scale it right. And there's some other attributes like color or texture, that it's fuzzy. And so you can build a cat that way. And so you can, you can solve for things that you never would have solved for. The other thing deep neural networks can do better than machine learning, again, I'm, I'm being a, taking a little bit poetic license here, is they can solve highly nonlinear problems. This is actually a fairly simple neural network problem, but Google wanted to try to minimize the power that they use in their huge data center with all their servers. You can imagine, it's massive. And so um, this is a curve, uh, the blue of, sorry, the red, of the actual power usage efficiency. So it's the difference between the power that you actually need to run the equipment that's dissipated and the power at the trunk line. And when it says 1.1, that means 10% was wasted. And it fluctuates as the servers go on and off, as the temperature of the chillers makes your data center different airflows and different temperatures. And they have thousands of sensors that give the state of the air, the chillers, the temperature, the air circulation, the workloads on all the different servers and their types and their configuration, literally, whether they're running Unix or some other operating system. And the curve you get is incredibly complicated, but guess what? If you take sort of a thousand variables, let's say, and you feed in the power usage efficiency, 
that you actually had, so this is a supervised case because you have examples of the answer, and you do that with several years of data, and of course, ideally your configuration of servers should stay the same, you can predict that behavior. So now, I feed in the current value of my variables, or what I might like it to be, and it can predict the power usage efficiency. Look at that nonlinear curve. It looks like a forex trading currency stock chart or something, but it can predict it. And that's remarkable. So the ability to map incredibly complicated nonlinear behavior is a big thing. And just to geek out for one more slide, and then I'll transition into some applications. Um, the thing that's so amazing about deep neural networks, and the reason that some of the pioneers in the field for 20, 30, 40 years sort of never gave up, is they knew that there was something special, which is that if this is a neural network and you input an image, think about this. How many images are there in a megapixel image with just a 256 grayscale? They're 256 to the million power unique individual images. There's 10 to the 78 atoms in the universe, 256 to the millionth power. And somehow, when I write an image detection algorithm that says that's a cat or that's a pedestrian, I have to take an input that could be any of those 256 to the millionth power images and find a way to sift through it and find a tiny infinitesimal subset in that space of images that I would say those look like cats or those look like dogs or pedestrians. And guess what? One of the magic of deep neural networks is whenever you have an algorithm or function with a lot of inputs or you're trying to solve a differential equation in space with a lot of inputs, a complicated integrated circuit, there's something, there's an explosion in complexity that happens um, with the number of variables. And in machine learning, it's on page seven of every machine learning book. It's called the curse of dimensionality. And it means that as you increase the number of variables n, the number of states you have to sift through explodes exponentially, goes to e to the nth power or something like that. Well, guess what? If as I step through this network, I rule out, say I'm trying to identify cat, that some of these things are cats, some are dogs. If I eliminate only a factor of two of the states at every point, but every time I step through the network, I eliminate two more, guess what? That's a decaying exponential that's like an e to the minus n. So it's searching through this space with exponential complexity and efficiency to find that one or small number of right answers. And the only trick is, this is in prediction mode, can you train it? 